addressing health literacy through patient and family engagement, key strategies, and the power of patient perspective. Before we begin, um, here are a couple housekeeping items. You can download the slides and resource material from the handout pane. We encourage everyone to participate in the conversation by typing your question and comments in the chat box. And please note that you will be mute until the Q&A session. And if you wish to speak, please click on the hand button to raise your hand and you will be unmute when it is time for questions. You can also adjust the size of your slide view by clicking and moving the three lines between the speaker panel and the slideshow. After the webinar, we will send you the recording of the webinar and we'll post the slides for download at PCPCC website. And last but not least, please help us by taking the post-webinar survey, your feedback will be greatly appreciated. About PCPCC, PCPCC, our patient-centered primary care collaborative, aims to advance an effective and efficient healthcare system built on a strong foundation of primary care and the patient-centered medical home. Our mission is to promote collaborative approaches to improve primary care. We also promote the shared principles of primary care, which represent all aspects of healthcare. We focus on the concept of patient-centered care through patient-family engagement and patient activation, which will help reach the goals of improved cost, quality, and experience outcomes. Through the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, PCPCC Support and Alignment Network strives to improve patient and family, clinician, and community strategy for engagement. We are working with our key partners to provide valuable education programs and technical assistance tools to help practice meet their needs. And to learn more about how we can help your practice, please visit pcpcc.org slash pcpi. And now I would like to turn to my colleague, Mary Minetti, the moderator of today's discussion. Great, thanks so much, Tanya. Let's see if we can get these slides to move. There we go, oops. So I am um, excited to be joined by my colleague, Marty Carney. Boy, technology has just given us a run for our money today. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. It's been crazy. Marty Carney is a senior patient engagement advisor and co-chair of Brigham and Women's Hospital Patient and Family Advisory Council Steering Committee and has been involved for um, many, many years in partnering with healthcare systems to improve the care for everyone. She's a 30-year, four-time survivor of breast and melanoma cancer and a founding member and past co-chair of Dana-Farber's Adult Patient and Family Advisory Council. I could go on and on about her being a PCORI ambassador and being involved in research, but our focus today is health literacy. And I want to be able, since we've started a little late, to have enough time for Marty and I to have a conversation um, about health literacy and how, as a patient advisor, she and others um, have been able to uh, work in partnership with healthcare organizations to make information more accessible, usable, and action-oriented for patients and families. So we have some key objectives here, and we really want you to mostly focus on the importance of engagement of patients and families and how, both as advisors and in direct care, um, we can engage people to better um, meet their needs and improve outcomes. We're going to uh, chat with Marty, and I'm going to just take a moment to be able to uh, share some, some basic information about health literacy. I'm going to do this very quickly. 
There's lots of materials that you can download. We've uh, downloaded five handouts, one of which is the slides, but, but more importantly, there are resources uh, within those five handouts that can be very helpful to you. So one of the things about health literacy is that it's a complex series of behaviors that um, are important to be considering. It's the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, understand basic health information and services needed for them to make appropriate health care decisions and also act on those decisions. Um, I think it's really interesting. My um, brother is in the hospital right now, and I've been chatting with his wife a bit. And um, they're, the whole issue right now for them is how they're processing the information that they're getting as a result of his surgery and, and his recovery and those kinds of things. But in 2013, healthcare began to very quickly and boldly and often talk about how important patient engagement is in order for us to achieve the outcomes that we want. In fact, in this issue of health affairs, they talked about how it was the blockbuster drug. That without engaging people in an active partnership between the healthcare system and those individuals who receive healthcare in their families, that we weren't going to be able to improve the delivery of care and we certainly weren't going to be able to achieve the reduced costs, the improved outcomes that we want. And we really think about patient engagement um, in two ways, in how we engage people in direct care and health literacy is really important to that, and how we engage them in helping us design organizational processes and programs and services in ways that are helpful. And what's true is that there's a whole depth of engagement. And I would say that the North Star is if we really have extremely well partnerships that are meaningful to patients and families, then in direct care, we're really co-creating care plans with them as opposed to telling them what we want them to do um, so that what matters to them is included and that they help us co-lead changes. So as we're developing programs and communicating about those programs, that, that we do that in a, in a shared way. And we'll be talking with Marty a little bit about that. Um, I thought it was interesting that information, um, there was a study done by Blue Cross Blue Shield of California Foundation about how important information is um, in empowering and engaging people, really mm -hmm. inviting them into being full members of their care team. And there are some key conditions upon which engagement happens. One is that there's strong relationships because there's continuity and connectedness in the services that they receive. And I know many of you that are in primary care are working in teams and trying to create continuity so that a team is is working in partnership with patients and families to deliver care to them. But they talk about that well-informed patients are comfortable asking questions. So how do we invite questions in ways um, and respond to them in ways that are meaningful to people? They become highly confident in making decisions when the information they get is useful and they can understand it. And they have explanations in ways that they can understand. And when those conditions are present, Eight and ten say that they would like an equal uh, role in healthcare decision making. So information is key, and so it's important for us to know that 36 percent of the population um, has basic or below health literacy skills, and that for certain populations, those that are listed on the slide, those who have uh, English is not their first language, as well as uh, seniors and people on Medicaid, people with chronic conditions certain ra racial and ethnic populations, um, they, um, that incidence is much higher. And most of what we care about in terms of achieving improvement in healthcare is impacted by health literacy. So um, unnecessary costs, people using the emergency department as their primary care source, often is related to a person's inability to navigate the healthcare system. And I thought that this was stunning information where um, certain aspects of health, low health literacy are widespread across populations regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of educational status. Nine out of ten U.S. adults have difficulty using everyday health information that we put out there. And in particular, one of the skills um, that people have a hard time understanding is having health literacy around numeracy, how we use numbers and help make sense for them about 
risks and benefits and those kinds of things. So we have to be really aware of the fact that if this is widespread and 40 to 80 percent of people that get medical information forget it um, immediately or remember it incorrectly, we've got to address in a universal way how we address health literacy. So I want to talk for just a moment um, about some health literacy resources that we would encourage you to become more familiar with. Um, Universal Precautions is a, is, uh, was created through AHRQ and uh, is a 175 page book about all the different ways in your organization that you can assume, just like you have universal precautions around infection control, that you develop universal precautions around health literacy so that your system um, addresses these things in such a way. But there are 32 best practices that are recognized in, um, in that particular document. And 25 health literacy experts rated the top five that through the work that they've been doing over years and in their research are most important to use and be aware of and implement and build into the fabric of your system um, that can make a big difference as it relates to improving people's ability to understand information. One is to avoid using medical jargon, and one of your handouts is, here's what we typically say in the medical arena, here are some other ways that we can say it that make it more plain language. So you've got a handout on that. Routinely using teach back or show me techniques. We can't assume that people, by just um, sharing information uh, verbally, that they really uh, understand what we're saying. And I thought it was really interesting as I was talking to my sister-in-law today, she was saying, you know, they're giving us a lot of information, but I need them to show me some things because that's how I best learn. The other thing is to use patient-centered communication, asking what questions do you have or what really matters to you and starting the conversation from where people are at and listening to what's important to them. And then how do you use universal precautions in oral and root written communication, stay um, current with that. And then it's really important to use medically trained interpreters for those whose preferred language is not English and not rely on their family members um, to do the translation. So be thinking about which of these practices do you have available. And you can uh, access the Health Literacy Toolkit. They have a short video. They have a, a quick start guide, and we really uh, recommend that you just do at least one thing, pick a tool and try it in your organization to begin to um, implement things because you can't do everything at once. And um, the North Carolina Program on Health Literacy has an excellent Teach Back video that really shows here's what Teach Back is in its best practice form and here are some ways that we commonly see people attempt to use the Teach Back technique but they do it incorrectly and so um, we encourage you to to become more familiar with those kinds of resources. And then a big um, program called Ask Me 3 is available um, in a variety of languages and have, have videos and downloads available. It's not important that you do all of these things. I'm just showing you some of the things that different organizations have implemented um, that have made a difference in their ability to communicate with their patients and families and really invite them to be full partners so that we don't create barriers because of um, their, their inability to understand the way that we talk um, and, and, and be able to make sense of it as it relates to how they need to, to do things in their organization, how, what kinds of action that we need to, to let them do. Some of you are smaller organizations and you aren't in a position to have huge education departments, so I wanted you to be aware that ACP, um, has a number of patient and family-centered resources and educational materials that are built with health literacy principles and have guides related to self-management for patients and families that you can download for free and make available to your patients. And they have them in a number of languages as well as English. So I wanted you to be aware of that resource so if you go, whoa, um, we don't... Uh, you know, how are we going to do that? They also have fact sheets on over 50 topics and some DVDs. So be aware of what are the resources that have already been created that can really help you. For those of you that are interested in measuring in some way health literacy, here are some of the questions that you can get um, through the CAPS 
that you can pull just even one question to ask people about um, to focus on uh, different aspects of health literacy. And uh, I want to share a couple quick examples of ways that people have taken action. So um, the Venice Family Clinic had an improvement aim. They wanted to increase their follow-up appointments with patients whose hemoglobin A1Cs were above 9. And they put together a small team of their QI advisor, the person who was kind of managing their diabetes registry, uh, registry and they coordinated with the diabetes providers and really tried to analyze what are we currently doing and how with health literacy principles can we improve that. And one of the common things that organizations do is they send out letters to invite patients whose hemoglobin A1Cs are above 9 to come in for mm -hmm. regularly scheduled appointments and visits so that you can work with them on improving that, um, making adjustments to medications or a number of things. And what they did is they analyzed their current letter and they realized that it was really hard for people to understand. And so they utilized something that was available as a resource to really identify what um, is the language that we're writing this at. And so they made some changes to their standard letter and they, it resulted and they both did it in Spanish and they did it in English because they had a high Spanish speaking population. And they had a 22% increase initially, and it's increased even more as they've tweaked this letter a bit. In response to the letters, patients were actually taking action, calling in, and scheduling appointments. And here's what they did. They looked at things that people commonly understand, like stoplights. Red is stop. You know, yellow is kind of cautionary, and green is you can go. And what they did is they actually told the patient what their record of their last hemoglobin A was, 1C was and put it within the stoplight and help people really understand um, that action was necessary. And when they, um, when they did that, they talked with their patients and they found that a number of patients said, you know, I would get those letters, but I felt fine, so I didn't really need, think that I needed to do anything. And so they also had the patient, patient's doctor and continuity as part of engagement actually name be in the letter saying, you know, Dr. Smith really would like to see you, we care about you, and some positive uh, language about you. Together we can um, make this, your health better. And so that was one example. Um, the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences decided to screen for low health literacy with one question and then know um, who they needed to provide more support and education and more a different way of approaching them um, than what their traditional was. And they based it based on evidence and what patients really found was most important. And they found a question that had been researched that was very important um, and could help people understand what their health literacy was. And the question is pretty simple. How confident are you at filling out medical forms by yourself? So they asked that question and people that answered somewhat, a little, or not at all, they created an entire approach with their medical assistants and others to what they would be doing um, to assist that person, not just in filling out the medical forms, but being aware that this, this answer to this question helped you understand that, um, that it was extremely important for teach back and some of these other techniques to be included as part of the way they worked with these patients so that they could um, be successful. And if you need more information about how they did that, I've got the person's uh, information available. So what we want to talk about is inviting patient and family advisors to help with health literacy improvements, and that's why we have Marty Carney here. Um, many organizations are doing that, and there are many ways that patients and families help improve um, with development of materials, sharing gaps in information, raising awareness with stories, serving as faculty in health literacy training. So lots of different ways to do it. But what I want to do is have an opportunity to chat with Marty for about 10 minutes and then open it up for questions that you might have. Um, and Marty, um, I've shared with everybody that you have had a lot, a long history of working in partnership with your healthcare clinics and organizations, both in the hospital, but also outside and in, in the ambulatory setting. Can you describe for me um, what kinds of health literacy um, activities and improvements have, have you and other patient advisors been involved in where 
you've made a difference and actually changed the way an organization is approaching sharing information about something. So if you can think of uh, a topic that you were involved in. I, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mary. I can think of a couple of topics, but one of them that uh, crosses a lot of uh, areas of care is the opioid situation. And so it was involved in our emergency department, but it was also involved in primary care. And it's been involved, involved with mental health. And it's been involved with our general medical services because these people come in and end up touching into all of those areas. So we started out when they changed the guidelines for um, prescriptions and the amount of prescriptions to work within the primary care group with some patients that were chronic opioid users, not addicted, and had them set up situations where their prescriptions would be every 28 days so that there would not be a gap in when the prescription ran out and when they needed it again. We also worked with them on the, in the uh, emergency department on the use of Narcan and, uh, and also on the use of uh, Subidox so that uh, we were able to take the information that had been put out by the clinical perspective and bring the patient perspective in and allow people to look through it from the patient lens and what was important. We did actually did a newsletter about the whole change of prescriptions for the primary care practice so that everybody would understand what it was and that you might be tested to make sure that you were using your medications properly, those types of things. That made a big difference in that. Um, we also um, started working on explaining the hospitalist role because patients and families that have admissions aren't really sure how to connect with their primary care practice. And as you know, most situations do not have hospitalists uh, in primary care practices, and the primary pra practice personnel are not in the hospital. That's the new way of doing business. So we wanted to be able to make sure that those connections went through and so that when somebody was discharged from the hospital, that the primary care could be caught right into the same line of traffic that they were going in for their follow-up care. Again, we use the patient lens, and I will tell you one easy or two easy things that I talk about all the time. Is one, when you're discussing this, remember, you're not doing it to or for, you're doing it with. That's where the partnership is. And in that process, I will say to the clinician, I know there's certain things that you need to have. Tell us what it is that is mandatory for you to have in whatever type of literacy work we're doing, and we'll tell you how to get it. You'll get it by using either a uh, health literacy program or just sitting down with a group of people that are part of the people that are in your audience and asking them what they see, what they get, what they understand, what is missing. All of the uh, information that you gave earlier, Mary, is applicable when you do this process, the teach back, the understanding. But the bottom line is, if you don't understand what you're hearing, you can't be compliant. You can't have decent, it's not even compliant. You can't follow the process well so that you can't have the appropriate outcome. If you're not comfortable with what you're hearing and you don't ask a question, you're not going to be able to solve your own problems. You brought up the fact that people miss such a large percentage of the conversation. So if you don't understand it to begin with, and then you're missing a large percentage of what the instructions are, you're not going to be able to benefit from the process. And that relationship that you have with your primary care physician is really so important to have the partnership of trust and understanding. So Marty, I wanna follow up on something that you said. You said a lot of really great stuff. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So one of the things that you, you do is you work, it sounds like you work in partnership with the clinicians on refining the messages, making the messages in language that's understandable for patients and families, um, that are positive messages that build partnership. And so you're working on some um, some handouts, I'm guessing, and, um, and reviewing the language in those. Um, is, 
is that part of what you did when you were working on the opioid? Um... Exactly, exactly. When they brought us what they were going to pass out as flyers and so forth, we just kind of took one look at them. First, we sent it through to get the health literacy level, and it was at the 13th grade level. Well, that's not going to fly at all, as you know, because we've got to get down to sixth grade level. You also have to look at the population because some of the work that we're doing need to be translated. Mm -hmm. So as you pointed out, so we, whether it's Spanish or whatever the language is that in your particular area or multiple languages, and we know the importance of that because you brought up the fact that you need interpreters sometimes to help uh, explain things to patients and families, even though their family members may think they understand it, medical language is very different, and, and the nuances that go with that need to be explained. So by doing those things, beginning to work together, we were able to change the, uh, really change the lens. And I will tell you one story. We were working on uh, medication uh, after surgery, and the uh, chief of uh, anesthesiology came in, and he had a great idea, and he wrote it all out. Well, nobody could have understood it. So we explained it kindly to him, and we worked with him. And after the third iteration, he said, well, I got down from the 17th grade level to the ninth grade level, and I'm getting a lot closer to the sixth grade level, so I can understand what you need, and I can give you what we must have. So again, that goes back to is what is it that you need clinically, but how do you explain it in a way that we can all respond to it? And that has happened in many different areas. So it's a culture change. It really is changing the way people think. And then working on that partnership and always providing the uh, patient and family-centered care guidelines of the beginning respect and information sharing and all of those things. And once you can get people to look at it in a different way, you really have the hook going forward to make sure that whatever the messaging is works not only for the clinicians, but more importantly for the people that they're messaging to, which would be our patients and their families. Great. I want to ask you one question because I'm I'm thinking that there may be somebody, there may be a number of people on the call who are thinking, wow, I work with patients around diabetes or I work with patients around self-management. And one of the things Marty said was I could have a conversation with those patients and they could advise me about what are the gaps or what are the questions that they feel are most important to have answered or that weren't answered when they first were diagnosed. And so um, some people might wonder, well, how would I invite somebody to work with me on this? And so can you tell a little bit about how you became a patient advisor and why you would even be interested in doing this? <laughs> well, um, my background was basically, uh, I was a cancer survivor originally. So uh, when we had the opportunity for the situation for the first adult patient and family advisory council, which was done through the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care, in 1997, they brought a group of people together, and that was the first time that we really realized that we could, in fact, have a voice and we could make a difference. And once that started, I have to say that it just continued to snowball into many other arenas. And as you know, uh, because we worked together for so long, that it started out as patient and family centered care, and then patient experience and patient engagement. And now it's really people have found out the true value. Uh, if you're going to do this work, you have to do it with patients and families in order to get the end result that is important to patients and families because that's who it's all about. So the organization invited you to be an advisor, and because you had a positive relationship with them, you said yes? Absolutely. And I had come from a background. I, I come from a medical family, and so I was used to having some early on uh, advocacy positions. And so that was helpful. I also was working for Verizon, so I was in telecommunications and in customer service. And all of these pieces play a role in your advisory position. But whoever wants to do any advisory work, you bring your lived experience in the healthcare system along with your own personality and in many cases your professional experience. One of our top advisors did uh, customer service for the Eastern Seaboard for American Airlines. 
he knew how to calm people down because that's what he had to do in a snowstorm. And so we worked on that to make these things fit into time management, into the way the clinic is run. Uh, people get upset about wait times. Joe and I did a whole wait time study and then put together a little blurb about it's important for you to be on time for your appointment and what the guidelines were according to the clinic. But it's also important for you to understand that in some cases, you may not be seen exactly on time because somebody may have an emergency, those types of things. So clearing up those communication issues and making people aware of the responsibility of their role and also the, the responsibility of the care providers and how we can make that come together was one of the first things that we really did starting out with that. And there's so many opportunities out there to do things like that. Great. And one of the things um, that you that you mentioned, I think that's really important, is that it's that relationship with a patient advisor and the clinic is really mutually beneficial. So it's not all about um, it's got to work for both people, and it's got to be respectful and and uh, and to come with some solutions that work from both perspectives. I want to stop now. Um, I know we went a little over because we started so late, but I want to um, turn it over to Marilyn so that we can see if there are any questions that have been chatted in or maybe people have questions that they want to chat in now. Um, but we had said that we would, uh, you know, kind of shorten the presentation so that we could really uh, answer questions that people had in the, um, that are attending the, the call. So, Marilyn, do you want to let us know if there are questions or? Um, I have not gotten any questions, only requests for some um, uh, addresses to get the material. So please, if you have any questions, put them in the, uh, the question box or the chat box, and I'll read them off, and uh, we can answer them. Great. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I thought it was interesting when I was talking with you, Marty, about the fact that you are so interested in health literacy that you actually went to a health literacy training. And I thought maybe you might share what your ahas from the patient perspective were about what you learned. Well, what my ahas were is that, it, as I said earlier, it's a culture change. And so it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of patience. It takes resources, but if you approach the team partnership properly, you can succeed. And when you succeed in making this work, everyone is so much happier. We now have clinicians that come to us with everything that they do and can't wait to show us their improvement in the way they look at things. So applying those principles, is not only beneficial to patients and families, and it's beneficial to the providers and staff, but it's beneficial to the whole healthcare system. Because if you have people that are getting their care and pleased and understand, they're the PR department. They're the people that are gonna talk about it. They're the people that are gonna make things happen in a way that is positive across the continuum of care. And that, to me, has been the biggest plus that I have had out of this to see people pick up something, whether it's, and we're working on telehealth now, which is a new field, working on making sure that telehealth is patient friendly to get the answers that the clinicians want. But it's making that partnership, the buy-in and the partnership work that, so that everybody benefits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, a patient advisory council at Providence Medical Group that were, um, they were moving toward a patient-centered medical home, and they mm -hmm. brought the, um, they hadn't created any materials yet, but they were in the process of, of uh, standardizing and creating what that would look like in their organization, and they brought it to patient and family advisors who were receiving care at some of their clinics, and the first thing that the individual said was, Patient-centered medical home. What is that? I already have a home, and so exactly. um, so they really 
raise the awareness of let's have a dialogue about what this is, tell us more, and then let's put some messages in there that are going to be useful for people who are now going to be getting care in maybe a little different way, and it'll be a positive way, but let's not get too hung up on the jargon and exactly. let's try to communicate what are we trying to accomplish and how important the patient and family member is related to that. And so they developed um, some flyers and things, and they basically went to their advisors to begin with. Um, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's great to do that so that together they created those materials rather than, and sometimes it's not possible to do that, but to, to look at materials that are already created and giving input is a good process as well. There's no right or wrong way to do it. It's the Absolutely. goal of having the partnership. So um, it, it is the goal of being short and sweet to make sure that you get your points across. Our medical home, we did a, a practice patient agreement, and it took us a long time to do it, but we started out with what the practice was going to do and then what the patient responsibilities would be and just made it an individual situation so that we would get patients and families to understand. And by doing that, not only did the patients and families benefit, but the staff had a great deal of aha moments as to exactly what was important and what would work for and with their patients and families in partnership. So it sounds like you really worked with the advisors and as a patient advisor really talked about from the patient perspective, here are the important things I would want in that relationship. And the clinician shared and their staff what was important in the relationship as well and, and created a joint kind of expectation thing. Mary, it exactly. looks like we have um, one question. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, this is from Rachel, and she says, you're doing the most important work in healthcare. Have you struggled to integrate your P, uh, PS uh, council? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> We've had lots of struggles, haven't we, Mary? Uh-huh. Uh, again, um, I think it, it's about the partnership, so I have to bring that up. But what you really have to do is have buy-in from the leadership at the top if it's not buy-in from the top and you don't get the resources, it is not going to happen. And that is sometimes very difficult. But I can tell you when over time we've learned to that we have succeeded is when and we use our um, management team and we use our leadership when they say their favorite meeting of the month is their patient and family advisory council meeting. They will because they get an opportunity to do the things that they really want and get feedback on what's important. And so if you can get to that point, uh, that is then, then you're in like Flynn, and then it moves on forward. But it is not an easy process. I mean, I give you that one or two examples. Mary, you may have better examples of how that is uh, challenging, shall I say? Well, what I would say is that people who haven't invited patients and families to be part of the team don't know what that's like, and so as is true of anything that you have never done before, there's some level of caution and fear about it, and often people think the worst possible thing is going to happen. Well, if we talk about what's not working in our clinic, somehow it's going to get on the front page of the paper. And often those myths and those fears are really unfounded, so sometimes if you can take small steps. So if any of you people are quality improvement facilitators and you work with a clinic or a hospital or whatever and you are facilitating improvement teams you can help facilitate um, the organization just dipping their toe in the water so 25 years ago when I went to my organization and I'd been hired as a quality professional but had done that outside the healthcare system I didn't know that there was a rule about not having patients and families so one of the things we did is I would often when just to start, when we were going to be doing, let's say, a diabetes improvement team, I would ask for some names of people who had diabetes that we were serving, and I would just call them up on the phone and say, Dr. Smith, I work for the organization. Dr. Smith suggested I contact you. We're looking to improve something, and I just want to chat with you about your experience. And so I was able to bring the patient voice back into those improvement teams, and that was a first little step. And then... Mm -hmm. 
then it was, well, why don't we invite some patients and families to help us with this improvement? Um, and so, again, looking to the clinicians and managers to help identify who those people are so that I could do the outreach to orient them, to prepare the people in the room that they're going to come in and those kinds of things. So there are a number of strategies you can use um, that are small to just get, you know, wet the whistle and the interests of people. But I would say that Marty's point is so well taken. I have heard across the country so many times from clinicians who are feeling really burned out um, and a lot of pressure that I, I kind of can get back into why I went into medicine, which is that interaction with the patient. But it's different. They're at the table with us, rolling up our sleeves, thinking about how we can improve things together. And so um, I think you start small and you um, and you have small successes and then you share those successes broadly and it reduces people's fear around what this is really going to look like. So Marilyn, I'm going to turn it back over to you because I realize that we said that we would just go for 45 minutes and I want to be respectful of people's time. Yeah, we do have another question and this okay. one is from Michael and it's what is the difference between an engaged patient and, a, uh, and an activated patient? Yeah. And what is the difference between engaged patient and the activated patient? Well, I'm going to comment on this, and then Marty, I'd be interested in, in what you have to say. So um, I'm very familiar with patient activation and worked with Judy Hibbard, who developed the patient activation measure. And basically, the patient, act, act, patient activation is defined as three things, the confidence, the skills, and um, the knowledge that people have to self-manage, okay? Right. So what's the difference between that and an engaged patient? Well, I would say that most patients are engaged in some aspect of their health care. And so it's, it's an interest in caring about their health and doing the best they can about that. So part of what you want to do is in order to invite people in, for instance, I would suggest that somebody whose hemoglobin A1C was out of control and calls a lot between meetings to ask questions, um, who may be way out of control, is engaged because they keep calling the healthcare system to try to get some assistance. But we may have missed the boat in connecting with them using health literacy principles so that they really understand what they need to do with their medications, as an example. So, so um, we have to, if, if you feel like somebody's not engaged, it might be because they don't have the confidence. Maybe they don't believe that they're an important member of the care team. So, um, Engagement is what I would suggest uh, the, is the behavior that you want to see, which is somebody's managing their medications well or um, exercising as they'd agreed. And oftentimes people say, well, they're engaged. Well, yes, um, that's once they've put all those three things together, the confidence and the skills and the knowledge, and they're, and they're um, able to, to um maintain certain behaviors, and the more activated they are, the more ability they have to maintain their self-management. But I wouldn't assume somebody who you might say doesn't have good health um, and may uh, struggle with that is not necessarily engaged. It's just that they may be engaged with what they value and what's important to them. And part of creating that bond and that partnership with them is finding out what really matters to be, to them because everybody's able to be engaged. Sometimes we disengage them in the healthcare system by not listening, by not understanding, and by talking way over what their health literacy is, um, so that they don't they can't take action and feel some level of confidence. Marty, do you have something you want to share about that? No, I think that was very well said. And then the other thing that I would just like to comment on is there's so many sort of buzzwords out there about all these patient experience, patient patients, this, that, and the other thing. And I think what you have to do is to narrow it down as what is important in your healthcare system to get the results that you need. Because an activated patient is, as you said, can be an engaged patient or cannot be. And a patient experience is very completely 
completely differently, and you can be part of everything. But the real goal is to make sure that that patient voice is heard in the areas that you need it to be heard in. And not only is it heard, but it's, it really has to be acted upon. Because when you get true patient engagement and true partnership, that means that that relationship is a two-way street. And that's when you really get, to, you're able to move forward with all of these changes. And the more the confidence grows, the more the relationship grows between the players on both sides of the team. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We also have a, thank you. Um, that was a good answer, good discussion. We do have two other questions. One was a statement that, um, uh, that first question about integrating the um, patient family council. Um, are you able to clarify, she wanted to know, are you able to get people of color in different cultures on your council? <laughs> That's always, I just had that conversation earlier today. Uh, that is always a challenge, but it is always a goal. And one of the reasons that we are able to do as well as we do in our environment is because we use our, our providers and we have some very diverse uh, primary care practices. And those providers will give us recommendations of people but that is always a difficult issue. As long as I've been in this, no matter how hard you try, it is not always easy to break that those barriers. We are doing better at it, and we're making we're looking at all the different avenues, whether it's a socioeconomic, cultural, um, gender, any of those types of things, to make sure that we are inclusive. And we we're always advertising that. But some people don't have the confidence, as you know, Mary talked to earlier. People don't necessarily have the confidence and they don't feel comfortable to be the only one in the midst of whatever. And so you can, we, at one of our primary care practices, we had an open house for our Spanish speaking uh, members of that practice. And we're working on trying to have them come in and meet the practitioners and feel more comfortable in a non-clinical setting and then find out what is it that we can do to make it more comfortable for you. So there are avenues, but I will say it is, it has been a challenge for the last 20 years that I've done it. And um, I do see that we're making some headway. And, and there are, some, yeah, and I would just say that there are some strategies so that if you um, reach out into the community and identify what are the trusted organizations outside of healthcare for those particular populations you're trying to hear their voice from, and sometimes you can reach out to leaders of faith communities and things and create um, opportunities to bring them onto councils to represent their populations, and then they can turn back into their community and, and say, hey, here are the things that we've been able to change in the healthcare system because we've gotten our voices involved and they can often identify some people. So that sometimes it's a stair-step approach. But I think it is, you do want your advisory council to represent the people that you serve. So you don't want them to all be white, retired um, men or women if you mostly serve a Hispanic population. And sometimes that means that you have to offer it in Spanish. and um, and uh, and so you just have to be aware of that. Did you say that there was one more question, Marilyn? Yeah. Um, it says, how do you identify patients that have health literacy concerns, and how is the uh, PFAC contributing to this improvement? Well, I don't know that PFACs identify people who have health literacy concerns. I think that um, uh, part of what you do is you – can use that one screening question that was earlier in the slide deck, and you can download the slide deck to identify people who have difficulty um, uh, filling out medical forms, because that often can be an indication. The other thing is to ask people how best they learn. And people who don't read well or understand well, they're gonna, they may say, I learn best by being shown, or I, 
learn best by watching somebody else do something or watching a video or whatever. And so part of what you want to do is you want to be in conversation with people about how they best learn so that you can um, make sure that you've got the ability to communicate around those things. And again, most nine out of 10 people have some aspect of health literacy issues mm -hmm. around either mm -hmm. obtaining, processing, or um, navigating the healthcare system. So universal precautions are really important. How do you make sure that all your materials are fifth, fifth to sixth grade reading level? How do you make sure that you're asking teach back? You're gonna understand if somebody doesn't understand how you've communicated if you use teach back, which is really not to ask them, do you understand, but can you explain me? I wanna make sure that I'm being clear and so can you explain in your own words what it is you think is the most important thing we've discussed today? And if people can't say that in their own words or they use Ask Me Three, that in a sense is a one-on-one -on -one assessment of what somebody's understanding of the information you've shared with them is. So all of those tools that are earlier in resources and some of which are also in the materials that you can download are all different ways to assess health literacy. And you can do it one-on-one, -on -one, and then you can, um, you know, implement things that make the most sense in your organization. Hopefully that's helpful. You know, I'd just like to add that just making your clinicians aware of the fact that health literacy can be an issue, and beginning to train them to look through the bifocal lens of what they need to do, but what their audience understand is a step in the right direction and and too often people think well um, if they've had a college education or they've graduated from high school that they're health literate they may have basic literacy skills but that doesn't mean that they understand the healthcare system we are so full of acronyms we're so full of uh, different jargon that uh, there are people regardless of what their literacy level is that aren't very health literate and don't have a lot of confidence about navigating the system. The example that the CDC gives us is that 80% of Americans do not know what a hemorrhage is, they do not know what a fracture is, and they do not know what a TIA is. Now those of us in the healthcare field know exactly what it is, but when you, that for me was an astonishing fact that I learned recently. Okay, it looks like we're running out of time. Um, and Mary, is there anything else you would like to add before I close out the webinar? Well, I was gonna just show the PFCC Connect slide. Whoops. So um, for those of you that are interested in continuing to learn, not just about health literacy, but, but join a learning network of people interested in partnerships with patients and families, um, you can join PFCC Connect. It's a free online learning community, and people can post questions and hear what other people are doing. The other thing that we are doing is we are uh, providing um, monthly informal conversations, and we just happen to be having an informal conversation about health literacy where people come, and it's not a presentation, it's where people come to share what they're doing related to health literacy, and it's going to be at 3.30 on Tuesday the 26th, and you can register for it. Marilyn and Tanya have maybe can send it out in the email that you'll get um, the way to register. There's no cost to it, um, and whoever joins are the right people to join, and we um, encourage people to bring what they're working on so that people can learn from each other. Again, we just presented a webinar. The informal conversation is just that. It's people networking and sharing with each other, not anybody doing the presentation. So we encourage you to join PFCC Connect and join our informal conversations. So that's really it, Tanya. Thank you for asking. Hi, and this is Marilyn. And before we go, I just want to say, someone had asked about the resources. Um, before you leave, if you want to download the handout uh, that we have on the site, but we'll also have them on the PCPCC website as well. And um, we will be sending out a recording of this um, of this webinar. And also, when you fill out the uh, the survey, 
if you did want to have like more uh, conversation about um, CFACs and health literacy, things like that, please indicate that on the survey and we'll, uh, we'll be happy to contact you. Okay, and please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions um, um, by, these are the in, um, contact information that you can reach out to us. And again, thank you so much everyone and I hope everyone have a good day. And thanks, Marty, for being a great chatter. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure as always. And, and I'd like to thank the team. You did an excellent job. Thank you, Tanya and Marilyn. Okay. Take thank care. You, thank you. All right. Bye-bye.